Okay. Okay, we are recording. Welcome, John. Well, thank you. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this event that is uh, hosted and co-sponsored by the Falmouth Public Library. I'd like to thank them. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, uh, Falmouth Community Television for agreeing to broadcast a recording of the event and the Falmouth Cultural Council for partially funding the, the presentation as well. Uh, we acknowledge that we live on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. Uh, so what are the beneficials referred to in this topic? They are uh, beneficial organisms that uh, help farmers and uh, gardeners to grow the food and other crops that we need. Uh, and uh, they come in three categories, the three Ps, pollinators, predators, and parasites. The pollinators are important because without them, uh, every generation of plants would be identical to their parents. There would be no diversity. There would be no resilience in, uh, in response to, to uh, changes or uh, no, no ways for those plants to improve in, in their vigor and, uh, and in other ways. Um, our, our pollinators do not include bats here in New England. That uh, They pollinate in the Southwest, but not here. However, we do have bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, pollinating flowers, also moths, wasps, flies, and beetles. 80% uh, of all plants need pollinators to set seed. And uh, so it's quite, a, uh, quite an important uh, role that these pollinators play. Uh, and one third of our food is pollinated as well. Uh, pollinators make a huge difference. Uh, you can see in the, that strawberry in the middle uh, received uh, no pollen from any other uh, strawberry flower. Uh, the one on the right uh, managed to get some windborne pollen from other flowers, but uh, the only uh, way that that plant was able to make a, a, a respectable strawberry was through open pollination where in, in which uh, pollinators actually visited um, that uh, flower and, and uh, brought enough pollen so that it could make a large fruit. <clears throat> so birds are categorized as beneficial organisms because uh, uh, two out of those three, the predators and the pollinators, they and primarily uh, pest control. They eat a lot of insects. Um, they also disperse seeds in the environment, uh, which is quite beneficial for the for the plants. And um, there are only two uh, birds that uh, are pollinators here in New England, the uh, ruby throat and the Baltimore oriole. Uh, bird pollinations have declined alarmingly in the last half century, and they will continue to do so unless uh, we as, as, uh, as a society and individuals both uh, make much different decisions that, than we have been making um, in, in the past centuries. And uh, it's not just the numbers of organisms, uh, uh, birds and other uh, vertebrates, as you can see in this chart, uh, are also declining in their diversity, which is an important uh, consideration for healthy ecosystems. So first, let's do no harm. And uh, one of the harm that we do is uh, having large picture windows that perfectly reflect the outdoors so birds don't perceive them as different from the outdoors and they uh, slam into those windows and are killed or, or stunned and then uh, injured in our easy pickings. So uh, we can uh, make our windows more visible to them. abcbirds.org is a website uh, that uh, is a resource to learn more about these techniques. <clears throat> Incidentally, I will share my email address at the end of this program and uh, you feel free to send me a message uh, requesting the list of resources that I've used to create this program um, and, uh, and the URLs that you see at the bottom of these slides will be included uh, in, in that list of resources. Uh, cats kill up to 3.7 billion birds in the US every year. That's both feral and house cats. So uh, it it's really important to keep cats indoors uh, in part for their own well-being because there are a number of predators out there that uh, that could harm a house cat and also other cats and dogs uh, that might be on the loose can can do some harm to cats. Uh, habitat loss due to agriculture and residential and commercial development is a, has had a huge impact on all wildlife including birds and climate change is a, a significant factor as well and and will become more and more significant 
the, the more intense it becomes. Uh, habitat loss, again, uh, due to climate change is one of those reasons. And uh, another is new, new pests and diseases that will happen due to climate change. Also disruptions in timing of migration, reproduction, breeding, nesting, and hatching. And uh, bird behavior may no longer be in sync with birds' food sources and other habitat needs due to climate change. So one of the things we can do differently is simply consume less or consume more mindfully. Uh, as you can see in this pie chart, uh, more than 40% of our carbon footprint consists of our purchases of food and non-food items. So we can uh, buy less food simply by growing it or uh, foraging edible wild plants or uh, uh, um, and, and in other ways, of course, we can lighten our carbon for, footprint depending on which food uh, we consume and, and how processed that food is. Uh, and, and in terms of non-food items, well, we can, uh, uh, we can buy used items instead of buying the new uh, or uh, trade with each other uh, for things that we need or, or simply uh, do or repair things or simply do without uh, whatever we don't really need. Uh, so uh, bird watching is a wonderful way for us to have a less materialistic culture and it brings us close to nature and helps us to feel part of nature. Uh, people who are uh, gardeners or bird watchers um, invariably have a, a much greater appreciation of nature and a, and a much greater awareness of the importance of, of uh, the, keeping the environment healthy. And we, uh, we are inspired by birds and delight in watching them fly and listening to them sing. And uh, 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 we're inspired by how devoted they are to each other and to their offspring. There are four things that birds need. And in fact, this is true of all um, um, animals, the food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. But again, please uh, first do no harm. Uh, do not feed birds baked goods or other junk food. And the reason baked goods are unhealthy is that they are often heavily processed, contain preservatives, salt, sugar, refined flour. They don't have enough of what the birds need, which are protein and fat. So they're empty calories. And uh, this bird was fed too much of this, these processed baked goods and it will never fly again. So approved foods for songbirds include eggshells, so not only for calcium, but also for, for the roughage that birds often need in their gizzards to digest their food. And bananas, apples, and raisins are among the foods that songbirds can eat uh, and, and other birds. Also oats, squash seeds, and pumpkin seeds, peanuts, and other any nuts uh, uh, for that matter, peanut butter. <clears throat> and there are a number of different ways that we can offer food for birds, in, including these do-it-yourself options that, that uh, uh, are, uh, that proliferate on the internet. Uh, if you have an open feeder like this, you will need to clean it often because birds, of course, will uh, foul that uh, platform. So, uh, and, and squirrels will eagerly help themselves to seeds unless you figure out some way to uh, bar them from accessing that feeder. Uh, placement of feeders, uh, um, consider uh, using a metal pole uh, because it's harder for predators to climb it. And if it's eight feet long, and if you bury it two feet down, it, it's just right at six feet uh, off the ground. And here's the 330 rule. Uh, your, your feeder should either be close to a window, less than three feet away, or more than 30 feet away. The danger zone three to 30 uh, is because the bird might be startled by a, a hawk that would be pursuing it and then uh, slam into a window or, or into the building. Uh, and it should be at least 12 feet away from vegetation because uh, predators can lurk in the shrubbery uh, and then pounce on unsuspecting birds while they're feeding. Perhaps a window feeder is the best design out there because uh, uh, not only do we get to see the birds up close, but the uh, uh, bird, if, 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 the, uh, if this feeder needs cleaning, we'll, we'll see it daily. It's easy to monitor it and, uh, and then promptly uh, clean it as necessary. Also, it's usually not accessible to squirrels or predators. It's perfectly fine to uh, feed birds in the summer. Baltimore Orioles love to eat oranges and uh, or even grape jelly. Uh, bluebirds will eat, uh, uh, will uh, happily accept uh, mealworms either dead or alive. 
<clears throat> and the uh, rose-breasted grosbeak and other birds uh, are happy to consume any seeds that are offered in, in your feeder. Uh, if you do decide to feed seeds, uh, to offer seeds in the summertime, keep those feeders uh, filled only halfway um, and refill them frequently to prevent mold, which will otherwise <clears throat> uh, uh, develop um, at the bottom of your feeder due to uh, uh, accumulation of moisture. Uh, move your feeders around to prevent the buildup of waste. Uh, when seeds f drop down to the ground, uh, uh, they, they could also become moldy and, and be a hazard to birds' health. Uh, so by, me by moving the feeders around, uh, there won't be so much buildup. And, uh, and finally, clean those feeders regularly, wash them every two weeks, rinse and dry before refilling. You can make your own homemade suet and they're only, uh, you can actually just uh, put suet itself out there, uh, purchased to the grocery store uh, in, a, in a suet container. Or uh, if you choose to use shortening and peanut butter, uh, you could uh, heat them uh, and uh, melt uh, until they melt and uh, it's possible to mix them together and then mix in the dry ingredients uh, and pour them into molds such as um, empty tin cans or uh, ice cube tray and freeze them for a couple of hours then they're ready to go. You can put the, that suet uh, in your suet feeder. Uh, do not use above 50 degrees, however, because the suet will turn rancid at warm temperatures. And you can buy a bird bath fairly inexpensively or even for no cost at all if you happen to have uh, uh, the uh, materials at hand. Uh, an upside down uh, garbage can lid, for example, can be a bird bath. Uh, heated bird baths are, uh, are appreciated by birds in the winter and uh, you can keep the, <clears throat> keep the water from freezing with a, a heating element uh, uh, that's fairly inexpensive. Uh, and birds uh, need different bird boxes depending on the species. Uh, uh, Allbirds.com is a great website to learn about making bird houses and tailoring them to a specific species. Uh, these eight species are included as, as in addition to many others. Um, so the, the dimensions for each species, uh, uh, for, for the box floor, the box height, the entrance height, the entrance diameter, and how far above the ground you would place that um, birdhouse will all be provided at uh, allbirds.com. Um, your basic bird box uh, has uh, holes at the bottom for drainage, holes at the top of the sides for ventilation, hinges on this one side so that you can open it to either inspect or clean it at the end of the season. And again, the metal pole, just like with feeders, a metal pole is good for a, a bird box to prevent access by predators. You want to place it in the shade, ideally. Uh, you want to give them a clear flight path and face that hole away from the prevailing wind. <clears throat> Starlings and house sparrows are, are both non-native birds. In other words, they are invasive aliens uh, and they were brought from Europe uh, and they never should have been because they've done a lot of damage here. Uh, they displace our native birds and they even uh, uh, eat, eat uh, the, the eggs and the chicks. Uh, so starlings and house sparrows are not protected by the state. You are free to trap them or harass them uh, if you choose. Uh, please do not offer colorful birdhouses. They attract the attention of predators. Also, perches are not necessary for birds, but they can be helpful for predators to access those uh, eggs or chicks. Uh, uh, birdhouses should be made entirely of wood and they should not be dangling from a string. They should be securely fastened to something. Uh, squirrels can uh, easily chew uh, the the sides of a hole and make it wider so they can gain entry. You can prevent that by uh, putting a metal plate with a circle, a, a circular hole in the middle and fi uh, fix that to the uh, uh, entrance. And, uh, and there are a number of nest predators uh, that can access that box unless you have uh, some kind of device to prevent that, especially if you would uh, uh, attach a birdhouse to a tree with, and many predators can easily access that house. So uh, a, a wire cage or other device uh, will be really important to protect those eggs and those chicks. At the end of the summer, you'll need to clean your birdhouse with a, a nine to one solution of water and bleach and give it a good scrubbing. Um, consider offering a roost box during the winter. Birds really appreciate having a place to uh, escape from the elements and to keep each other warm. Uh, you could either make one or, or purchase one uh, online. 
Uh, and there are a number of nesting materials that we can offer birds in the spring when, when they're creating their nests. Um, and they could be placed in a suet feeder or in a mesh bag. Uh, people often uh, offer their, uh, 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 the, their pets um, uh, hair or fur when they're, when they're combing and grooming their, uh, their cat or dog, they'll put that fur out on a, a twig of a, of a shrub so that uh, birds can find it and use it in their nests. Now there's nothing better for uh, so many chicks than caterpillars, this ideal baby food for them because it, it, they're soft, they're easily digestible and they have all the nutrients uh, that those chicks need to fledge. And this mama black cap chickadee will need six to 9,000 caterpillars in order to fledge her chicks. They're hungry and, and they, they need a lot of food. And Doug Tallamy has, offered, has, read these, uh, has written these two books uh, explaining how important it is for us to establish native plants uh, to feed the caterpillars. The reason that native plants are so important is that non-native plants are essentially inedible to most uh, caterpillars. Uh, they, they haven't had a, a, enough time uh, to figure out how to uh, digest the, uh, the chemicals that, that are in those leaves that, uh, that defend them from being eaten. So, um, uh, we, we really need to focus our efforts on establishing native vegetation in order to provide this, uh, this really vital resource to birds uh, when they're raising their chicks. And uh, his, uh, his uh, book, Nature's Best Hope, uh, is all about the, the need to, uh, uh, to, to think in terms of private land as being uh, the key to the salvation of birds and wildlife because so much of our land is now in private hands. Uh, so the best trees, vines, and shrubs to plant for list for, for birds, uh, this is a list that was uh, provided by uh, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, the website allaboutbirds.org. And the uh, oaks are fantastic because there are so many caterpillars that visit these oak leaves and birds can come and, and help themselves. Uh, there's no fruit that I can think of that's more popular with birds than mulberries. Uh, I think they're delicious myself. Uh, and it's, it's really a delight to watch the number of different species and, uh, and uh, just the sheer number of birds that come and vis visit a mulberry tree when it's in fruit. Uh, sassafras fruits are also appealing to many birds as are elderberry fruits. This is another one that I also enjoy. Uh, uh, I put elderberries in my pancakes, my muffins, uh, hot cereal. Uh, it's a very uh, healthy uh, fruit for, for and, and medicinal fruit uh, for people. Elderberry syrup is great to, uh, to stop uh, the, the, the flu uh, uh, or to guard against the flu, uh, but it's a great plant for birds as well. And uh, it's, it's often thought that in order to uh, have beautiful plants in your yard, you need to buy exotic plants. Well, I beg to differ. Uh, our native plants can be absolutely gorgeous as well. And this is a, an example of the, uh, one of the viburnums, wild raisin or nannyberry, beautiful in all seasons and also attractive to birds. So uh, instead of plant, just planting ornamentals, why not plant ornithomentals? Uh, you'll recognize ornitho being the, the root of ornithology, the study of birds. So it's a, a, a plant that's for birds and for uh, human appreciation as well. Another ornithomental arrowwood, another uh, uh, on viburnum, and uh, and this uh, small viburnum, uh, maple leaf viburnum, uh, in uh, that that uh, does well in the shade in the in woodlands. And the uh, uh, viburnum dentatum, black haw viburnum, is more like a, a tree, and they're all just beautiful uh, in in the in different seasons. And then there's the there are the dogwoods. Uh, birds eat the fruit of of all dogwoods uh, and. Uh, migrating birds in August and September might strip this uh, uh, gray dogwood clean of, of uh, berries, uh, of fruits. And another one, uh, the red osier dogwood, uh, and certainly a, another ornithomental here. It's be beautiful uh, it, with its uh, stunning red uh, twigs in the, in the winter uh, and all season beauty. Um, white dogwood is another popular one for with both humans and, and birds. And you can get uh, 10 free white dogwood trees uh, if you visit arbortday.org and make a contribution of any amount, uh, you might decide to get one uh, of each of these shade trees or 10 white dogwoods, 10 American redbuds, 10 river birches, or 10 of any of these half dozen conifers. 
uh, just for uh, that making that contribution of, of any amount you choose, uh, arborday.org. Spicebush is a shrub that is half uh, fat, which is an important uh, energy uh, source for birds. Uh, and what bird wouldn't uh, eagerly devour uh, blueberries, either high bush or low bush. Uh, and the Juneberry tree is, it has fruits that uh, in my opinion are just as delicious as blueberries. I think birds agree. And it's an, another stunning ornamental uh, in, in all seasons. Uh, Hawthorn is another uh, a tree uh, with edible fruit for birds, so is crab apple. Uh, and the, the wild cherries, black cherry and choke cherry. Uh, and here's a, a native shrub called black choke berry. It's not a cherry, actually. It's a, uh, and, and it's a shrub, not a tree. Uh, and uh, it has often been grown as an ornamental uh, by people who are totally unaware that it's uh, not only food for birds, but humans as well, uh, if you know how to cook it. Um, and uh, in fact, it's an incredibly medicinal and healthy plant for, for humans. Um, you know, now, if you want to learn more about any particular plant, uh, just do a search for either its common name or its Latin name, in this case, Aronia melanocarpa, uh, and then add Missouri, uh, because Missouri Botanical Garden uh, gives this information about uh, an impressive number of plants. Uh, whether they're native or, or non-native. Uh, and uh, so you'll want to know if the plant can be grown in your zone. You'll want to know how large that plant will be at maturity and uh, all this other information, the water needs, the sun needs, uh, and uh, that the fact that it can grow uh, in wet soil is, is useful to know, although it will not insist on wet soil. Uh, and the, this uh, garden locations means uh, you can find where to purchase the plant. Uh, so the canes, blackberry and black raspberry, uh, are uh, have edible fruits for birds. So does the staghorn sumac. And uh, into the beginning of winter, those fruits are still available. Uh, and all through the winter, winterberry holly, a stunningly beautiful uh, tree uh, on, in our landscape, uh, will give nourishment for birds. And so will northern bayberry in the middle of winter. Uh, and the conifers are a source of seeds and also uh, offer a, a place to, uh, uh, for birds to, to shelter, to um, uh, build their nests, and even to find caterpillars. White pine, surprisingly, is host plant for uh, a couple of hundred different species of caterpillars. Uh, and then there's the fruit of the wet eastern red cedar as well that birds will, will uh, make use of. So uh, when you consider what, uh, what tree or shrub you uh, might put in what place, uh, and as this applies to um, herbaceous plants as well as woody plants, uh, be aware that different uh, areas of your land might have different conditions, such as uh, how, uh, how much sunlight there is. Uh, the moisture and drainage uh, might vary from one end of the spectrum to the other. The soil texture, likewise, could be quite sandy, quite clay, or somewhere in between. The, the happy medium would be loam. Um, and you can find plants that will do quite well in, in a number of these different extreme situations. However, no plant can grow in compacted soil. And that's an important thing to be aware of whether you in fact have a com whether compaction is a problem in your landscape. And you can do a test uh, or you can have a test done by a soil testing laboratory. Uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst has one. Uh, just send them a sample and they'll tell you about the macro and micronutrients that are in that soil, um, as well as the fertility, if you uh, ask about the organic content, and the pH will also be included. Uh, so once you've decided uh, which plant you, you want to uh, purchase and, and where you want to put it, and you have that plant in hand, uh, you want to dig an extra wide hole, no deeper than necessary. The reason that you want that hole to be so wide is that the roots um, grow um, closer to the surface in order to intercept the water and nutrients that are available uh, there much more than they are deeper in the soil. Uh, so by digging a wide hole, you're going to make it easier for those roots to grow laterally. Uh, and if you keep the topsoil and subsoil in separate piles, you can return the uh, subsoil first and then the topsoil at the top where it was initially when you uh, reestablish that plant. Uh, 
a, a, uh, you can consider a mulching all the way out to the drip line uh, and you can create a, a, a rim around that uh, sapling uh, to receive water, much like a, you're, you're creating a bowl that, that'll hold that moisture when you uh, irrigate it or when it rains. And don't forget to irrigate your plants uh, during a prolonged drought, uh, especially uh, in the first couple of years of their lives to ensure a healthy growth, uh, but also don't overwater. Um, and you might want to protect your saplings from any animals that might be hungry, and especially in the winter when food is scarce, uh, they can find nourishment in the bark of uh, trees and shrubs. And that, uh, and if they do that, they can kill the, the plant because uh, 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 trees can't live without uh, uh, intact bark. So uh, the, the list continues. Virginia creeper is a vine with edible fruit for birds, although these uh, fruits are toxic to us. And both birds and humans appreciate grapes and use them as food sources. Uh, uh, birds will uh, also visit uh, hunt wild honeysuckle for the fruits. And, uh, and this uh, ground cover, uh, bearberry, uh, which is evergreen and uh, it requires full sun. It's a beautiful uh, plant in your landscape. Uh, what bird wouldn't eagerly eat sunflower seeds? Uh, but this is not the only uh, plant that has edible seeds. Other, especially other members of this family, the aster family or asteraceae, and you can see the family resemblance between sunflower and black-eyed Susan, uh, also uh, purple coneflower. And in fact, all of the plants on this slide, with the exception of sedum, are also a member of the asteraceae family and have edible seeds for birds. So do uh, some grasses for that matter. So if we leave the seed stalks standing in the winter, uh, th that uh, source of food uh, will remain available and also uh, it, uh, they will provide habitat for insects. Uh, and in fact, uh, leaving the leaves uh, is, is another thing that we can do uh, for the benefit of both birds and the insects that they prey on. Uh, caterpillars will drop from the canopy at the end of their uh, 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 life uh, or at the end of the cycle in which they're caterpillars, they'll uh, and they'll, uh, in order to uh, make it through the winter, they have to uh, find some place to that's safe uh, uh, and protected. So uh, leaf litter or other vegetation, natural vegetation uh, is appropriate, but uh, uh, either grass or bare ground uh, will offer them nothing in the way of production and, and they'll be easy pickings. So uh, try to have as much uh, natural vegetation or leaf cover as possible on your property. Um, Dead trees are also valuable for wildlife, including birds, uh, if you can uh, leave them standing and if that will not uh, create a hazard to people or to your dwelling. Uh, and create uh, brush piles for, uh, for birds and other animals. They create, they offer sanctuary, shelter, and snacks, the three S's. Uh, now to review, birds need four things, uh, as do all animals, food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. And uh, we can offer them these things, uh, at least the food, shelter, and places to rear young, uh, simply through the selections of plants that we establish in our landscape. So gardening for wildlife connects us to nature. And uh, unfortunately, too often, there's an expectation uh, that uh, in order for our plant to, uh, for our property to look uh, well cared for and, uh, and attractive, uh, it has to uh, be manicured. And uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that leaves nature out of, of the picture, uh, unless perhaps that tree is a native tree and is offering habitat. Uh, but uh, the lawn is a huge problem. It, it began as a status symbol four centuries ago in Britain when the aristocracy could uh, demonstrate how wealthy they were simply by, uh, uh, instead of growing food in, in every available uh, space, uh, which uh, less well-to-do uh, uh, individuals would, would be required to do for their survival. They demonstrated just how, um, uh, how uh, 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 their, their, their status, uh, their, their wealth by having lawns of grass that people would, and they would hire people to use scythes to cut it and keep it looking, looking great. Well, uh, unfortunately that uh, tradition remains with us, but lawns are a food desert, a polluter, and a resource guzzler, especially if, if we have these standards of perfection and uh, weed-free lawns. So the cost of lawns 
uh, is considerable. We use far more synthetic pesticides on our lawns than farmers do per acre. We also use a, a huge amount of water to keep that uh, grass alive. The unfortunate reality is that Kentucky bluegrass and other grasses that we plant are on life support here in the United States. They just don't, uh, they can't make it through a summer looking good without being watered. Uh, it, we, we would be more sensible uh, to use a turf type tall fescue as our dominant grass because uh, it has roots that are uh, that go down as deep as four feet. So it requires much less or no watering. It also doesn't need as much fertilizer. You don't have to mow it as often and it does fine in shade or sun. Uh, now, if you've had difficulty establishing a lawn due to shade or standing water or erosion, another uh, approach is simply to plant native perennials, shrubs and trees that know how to handle those conditions. I invite you to visit Mary Ann Borges website, thenaturalweb.org. Uh, wonderful articles uh, can be found there. And also she is an uh, extraordinarily talented nature photographer. Environmental organizations are asking us to reduce our lawns by at least 25%. I think that's a reasonable goal. And not only will, will we feel good about what we're doing and helping wildlife, uh, we'll be, uh, it, it's a, just a delightful experience to have uh, more varieties and quantity of plants to, to watch and discover, uh, to learn about and to learn about their interrelationships with the, the animals that visit them. Unfortunately, many people have concerns about natural landscaping among them, uh, whether it, they will attract vermin, but the, uh, the fact is that natural landscapes do not attract or sustain rats. Uh, Lyme disease ticks are a legitimate concern, uh, but uh, we can, there are things we can do to protect ourselves. And one of them is to establish setbacks or paths for walking because ticks cannot uh, attach themselves to you unless you uh, brush against them and they, they're uh, lying and waiting uh, on, on vegetation with their uh, uh, front legs outstretched, re ready to grab onto you if you make contact. So if you're walking on a path and don't make contact with vegetation, there's no way that a tick is able to uh, fly or hop onto you. I invite you to visit LymeDisease.org for more information about prevent, preventing ticks in your yard. Uh, you can also consider using tick repellents with any of these four ingredients. And uh, 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 permethrin is a wonderful, uh, uh, a sp you can spray with permethrin, spray your uh, uh, clothing or gear with permethrin uh, 48 hours before uh, you go outside. And, and it's uh, remarkable how it doesn't just um, repel, it actually kills ticks, mosquitoes, chiggers, mites, and other insects. Uh, it lasts through six washings, uh, and then you'd have to respray. And if you have factory treated clothing, that lasts through 70 washings. Also, keep in mind that there are a number of animals out there that uh, are happy to uh, gobble up those ticks. And so it's, it's uh, uh, natural landscapes are a good thing to have for that reason. Uh, mosquitoes are a concern for many people, but the fact is that standing puddles uh, are, that, uh, that offer mosquitoes a, a breeding ground are actually more likely to happen uh, in lawns uh, with, that don't absorb very much water. If you do choose to have a, a pond, uh, and it's, ponds are great for wildlife, uh, including insects and birds, uh, just keep in mind that it's stagnant water that's the problem. So you can keep the water in motion with a solar activated pump. You could also stock the pond with koi, goldfish, or mosquito fish. And uh, uh, the bacterium called BTI, uh, and uh, commercially uh, you buy uh, something called mosquito dunks or mosquito bits. And uh, if you put them in the water, they're, they're quite effective at killing mosquito larvae and, and they are safe to the environment. So uh, allergenic pollen is a concern for many people. Uh, the fact is that it's the non-native plants and grasses, the weeds and such that produce the most allergenic pollen, the ones that are uh, wind borne, such as uh, public enemy number one, ragweed, and others like lamb's quarters, red root amaranth, and English plantain also have wind borne pollen. So do some grasses. Um, so uh, we all want our properties to, uh, to uh, at least maintain, if not uh, increase in value. Uh, and and uh, it's been demonstrated that actually 
uh, planting a single tree will add thousands of dollars of value to your property if it's so uh, um, well uh, well situated on your property and, and, it's, and it becomes a, a nice healthy specimen that, that that's, uh, that's attractive. Um, and uh, so uh, if the entire property is landscaped uh, uh, with nature in mind and done so in an attractive way, uh, you're a, your property is bound to uh, significantly increase in value. Uh, one way to, to do that in a tasteful way is to have a, a massing of, of one species of plant that can be quite uh, uh, impressive in, in its beauty. Uh, covering the foundation is a, a rule to keep in mind, uh, putting plants against the, the, the exterior walls. And, uh, and uh, it doesn't have to look unkempt uh, when you plant a variety of species that are serving nature, it, get, it can have a very uh, a planned look and, uh, and be very pleasing to the eye. Well, one of the first considerations when you're planning your landscape is uh, doing an inventory of invasive plants. Uh, and uh, after, you, um, after you learn how to identify them uh, for, and then find them on your property, make a realistic plan for eradicating or controlling them and follow through with that plan. Uh, you definitely don't want to, to let them advance and take over because that's what they will do if you give them a chance. Japanese knotweed is a, a terrible uh, scourge on the, in the environment. And if you try to uproot it, um, it, it simply, uh, it, there are always gonna be small pieces of root that will then um, uh, sprout uh, anew. So uh, you could continue to uh, uproot or, uh, and, and weaken the plants to a certain extent because the, the, the larger roots are, have certainly more energy reserves than the small ones. Uh, however, uh, a, a, a more effective, uh, and it, it would take, uh, by the way, if you, if you kept cutting the plants at the base, it would take about three years doing that consistently every couple of weeks throughout the growing season. Uh, it would take three or four years to finally uh, kill those roots. Uh, but uh, another approach is to uh, uh, chop them all to the ground and then cover them with a heavy black plastic or other barrier uh, just to make it impossible for those uh, sprouts to emerge. Uh, Oriental bittersweet is another terrible invasive species that actually kills trees. Uh, the, the vine will uh, girdle trees and, and, and uh, cause them to die. Uh, if you have any uh, oriental bittersweet vines that have uh, made it up to the canopy, be sure to uh, lop them off at the base so that they're, uh, they can no longer uh, grow flowers and seeds that will be tempting to birds and uh, birds will, will spread them all over uh, the region. Uh, and uh, uprooting oriental, bitter, oriental bittersweet vines is also advisable uh, where possible. Uh, autumn olive is a, a nitrogen fixing shrub that was brought here intentionally for reclamation purposes, but it's done its job all too well and made itself way too welcome here. So uh, please uh, uh, eliminate autumn olive uh, when possible as well. The same is true for multiflora rose. We have far too much of this plant. It takes over and excludes uh, native plantings. Uh, bush honeysuckle is another uh, uh, invasive to, to watch out for and uh, must also be uprooted. Burning bush uh, may no longer be sold by nurseries. Uh, it's, it's been attractive because of its uh, vibrant foliage in the fall, but really that foliage is only putting on a show for a couple of weeks. The rest of the year, it, it's, it's really a fairly ho-hum plant. Uh, but uh, uh, so burning bush is also on that invasive species list. So are gotweed, garlic mustard, black swallowwort, and a number of other plants that you can uh, learn about if you go to masslive.com and they will give you suggestions for how to eradicate those plants. Uh, and again, the, the, uh, the, the two, the two te uh, techniques that are usually the most effective are uprooting and smothering. Well, migrating birds actually prefer native fruits. A study was done that, uh, that showed uh, that uh, even when blueberries, black cherries, and black raspberries were fairly scarce, and such plants as Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, and multiflora rose were quite common, those native birds were still seeking their favorite foods, the native fruits, in, in preference to the invasives that uh, just don't taste as good to them. They, they're probably not as nutritious. Uh, 
but they will eat them uh, if they can find nothing else. Poison ivy is a native vine and uh, fruits, those white fruits of the poison ivy uh, are actually a winter food source for birds. But it's totally understandable if you want to uh, eliminate poison ivy in areas where uh, um, humans might come in contact with it. Um, and one way to eliminate any unwanted vegetation, whether it's a patch of poison ivy, a, a, a an area of lawn that you want to repurpose for native plantings, uh, weeds, what have you, is to uh, chop it all back to the ground and or mow it and then smother it with cardboard or six thicknesses of newspaper. Uh, these are all biodegradable. Uh, so um, and then water it down and, and get it wet so that it'll uh, uh, help help it on its way to uh, being able to be uh, uh, be become uh, uh, part of the nutrition of the soil basically is, is, what, is what, what it's destined to do. But at first it will do its job of killing the vegetation uh, below it. And then, uh, and, and that vegetation will also be, uh, will also decompose and become part of the fertility of your soil. Uh, and if you're growing uh, vegetables or, or something for a, a harvest, uh, you might want to put some compost down uh, after you put down the a cardboard or newspaper. And then uh, the top layer is the mulch layer, uh, which, will, uh, which will help keep the, uh, uh, the, the weed seeds out and to keep the moisture and, uh, in. Um, so uh, you can, uh, and, and this product on the, uh, uh, in the lower right corner is called, uh, well, Ramboard is one of the uh, uh, names for it, uh, or a, a trade name, but uh, gen it, it, the, the idea is it's a, a long, uh, roll of cardboard-like material that uh, uh, painters use to protect floors when they're painting, but it can also be used for sheet mulching large areas that if you can't find enough uh, uh, cardboard to do the job. Uh, but keep in mind that it can also be done on a small scale, such as the uh, uh, raised bed here that you see in the upper right. Um, and, and it can be done any month of the year, even in the middle of winter. As long as there's no snow on the ground, you can go ahead and apply uh, the uh, cardboard or the, or the barrier layer, and then uh, add the, uh, whatever other layers you want, the, the compost, the mulch. Uh, and then when the weather warms, uh, it, it will start uh, to do its job. Uh, so again, mulch suppresses weeds, keeps the soil moist and cool, and enriches the soil. Uh, and the types of mulch you might consider using for your annual beds, such as the vegetables and annual uh, flowers, uh, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, and pine needles are all perfectly appropriate and, and helpful. Uh, pine straw or pine needles do not make the soil acidic, as uh, many of us have been led to believe. The, the uh, science has shown that uh, that's just simply not the case, uh, and they're quite effective at, as a mulch. Uh, perennial beds can also be mulched with leaves or pine needles, but uh, pine bark, wood chips, chip branch wood are other uh, materials that you might consider using for perennial beds that, that last a little bit longer. Please don't use dyed mulch. It's often contaminated with creosote and CCA, and the, that, the, that's bad for the plants. Uh, also, please don't mound mulch around trees. Uh, it will uh, encourage roots to grow where they shouldn't, uh, way up on the trunk, and then those roots will become ex exposed as the uh, mulch either uh, erodes away or, is de or decomposes. Um, and think about mulch as a temporary expedient uh, to protect the soil. But once, the, once your plants have, have really taken off and are commanding that, uh, that garden bed or uh, that area of your, uh, uh, that, that planting area, uh, you won't need the mulch because the plants are doing the job of keeping out the weeds and keeping the soil uh, moist and cool. In this case, you're looking at a rain garden so that uh, this bed is, is receiving water uh, from the downspout and, uh, and these plants all benefit from that water and are, are doing just fine. Any excess water comes down that, uh, that pebble path at the bottom of the garden bed there. Uh, and another way to uh, keep the, uh, the soil moist and prevent weeds from coming in is to plant a living mulch or uh, ground cover plants. Uh, and ground covers also hold soil in place on slopes. Uh, I mentioned the bearberry as one of my favorite uh, ground covers that uh, uh, that's attractive to birds. It's also a pollinator plant for that matter. Uh, here's another one, thyme. When bees pollinate uh, thyme, they get the, the benefits of thyme oil, which helps them 
uh, to combat varroa mites. Uh, three leaf cinquefoil, a beautiful evergreen ground cover that's native. Uh, golden star, these uh, uh, sprightly yellow flowers that, that are blooming for weeks at a time. Uh, wild ginger can handle dense shade and uh, it, it, it is also used uh, as a condiment. Uh, Bishop's had another shade tolerant plant with there's this beautiful uh, fo uh, foliage and intriguing flowers. Uh, this is our native Pachysandra. Our Japanese Pachysandra is, is actually quite invasive and, uh, and it's less attractive, I think, than our native Allegheny Pachysandra, which is shade tolerant as well. And then you, we have barren strawberry, which, uh, which blooms in the spring, uh, and our wild strawberry. Uh, are all uh, good ground covers to consider. Now let's move on to uh, uh, hummingbirds, which are both predators and pollinators. Uh, they are ex excellent hunters uh, and they, uh, uh, they include uh, a number of insects in their diet, such as mosquitoes, flies, gnats, ants, insect eggs, insect larvae, and spiders. Uh, and a uh, ruby-throated hummingbird is our, uh, the only uh, hummingbird that, we are, that you're likely to see here, here in New England. Uh, occasionally a rufus might show up, but in general it's the ruby throat uh, and their population has doubled in the last half century. So we don't need to be concerned at this time for their, uh, uh, for their status, uh, uh, conservation status, but it, uh, people love to invite them to their yards. So uh, hummingbirds and other birds for that matter find moving water irresistible. Uh, and also they uh, appreciate a place to rest so we can provide them with snags for, perch for perches. Um, and uh, by leaving dead trees standing, uh, those uh, yellow-bellied sapsuckers will drill holes uh, in the trees. Um, this, the sap then uh, in those holes attracts insects and, uh, and hummingbirds can come and help themselves to those insects. Uh, and by welcoming webs, we provide spider silk for hummingbirds, which they need to construct their nests. Uh, and because they have spider silk in their nests, uh, those nests will expand to double their original size as those uh, eggs hatch and the chicks grow. An expandable nest is really quite an impressive uh, uh, feature of uh, hummingbird nests. Uh, it's okay to rescue a hummingbird or any chick if you find one on the ground and if you know where the nest is. It's, uh, it's not true that the, the adult birds will reject that bird, that chick, simply because you've touched it. Uh, but, but also, you, you don't want to hang around uh, nests and watch them, uh, watch the chicks and that sort of thing, because that will um, attract a predator's attention to them. Uh, now, if you decide to offer a hummingbird feeder, this is a good design. Uh, this, uh, you can separate these two bowl-shaped tabs uh, and uh, clean them easily uh, compared to other feeders. Uh, you want to use only water and sugar, no food coloring, and it's a four to one ratio of, of water to sugar. And you would uh, you have to have to heat it to dissolve that sugar and then refrigerate it and use it within one week. And you'd want to replace that food every few days and clean the feeder every three days. In order to clean the feeder, use hot tap water, uh, scrub the sides, don't use soap uh, because soap residue is harmful for hummingbirds. Black mold may appear on your feeder. So in that case, you will need to soak with bleach uh, solution, one to 64 ratio, ratio of bleach to water for one hour. Now, in the warm temperatures, that nectar can, be, can spoil and, and will need to be replaced. And in fact, it can start to ferment in just one day. So I hope I've impressed on you just how important it is to be vigilant about your cleaning of, uh, of uh, hummingbird feeders. I would rather offer hummingbirds flowers, uh, which you never need to worry about. Uh, that nectar will always be fresh and it'll be just the right combination of sugars that they need. It'll also provide trace amounts of minerals, proteins, and amino acids that are essential in their diets. This uh, vine, trumpet creeper, uh, is a robust vine. Don't plant it near your house. It might uh, do damage to fixtures of your house, uh, but if you plant it elsewhere on your property, uh, there will be so many flowers uh, that will uh, be uh, quite a banquet for a number of hummingbirds if they find it. Here's another popular uh, vine with uh, hummingbirds, the trumpet honeysuckle. Um, cardinal flower, uh, hummingbirds love the color red and they find it in this flower. Uh, uh, butterflies also visit cardinal flower. 
uh, wild columbine is another one that they visit in the spring. It's a spring blooming perennial, a native uh, wildflower that hummingbirds can benefit from when they've arrived uh, from their migration. Uh, butterfly weed is another one that they'll eagerly visit. And, and so you can see that, butterfly, that hummingbirds don't require uh, red flowers. Anis hyssop, obedient plant, blazing star, uh, swamp milkweed, foxglove beard tongue, uh, purple cone flower, and flocks are among the species that they will visit for nectar. Uh, now bats are also beneficial because they eat nothing but insects and the two most common bats in New England are the little brown bat and the big brown bat. The little brown bat population has declined by 90% due to white nose syndrome, a, a fungal disease. So we can offer clean roosts that don't have this, uh, uh, that are not infected by white nose syndrome. Um, either uh, purchasing one online or, or making one, uh, visit mass.gov to learn more about bat houses and their placement uh, under the eaves and, and south facing as a good location. Uh, you're, we're not allowed to evict bats in the middle of summer because they are raising their pups at that time. So uh, again, mass.gov will explain how and when to evict bats safely and humanely. Leave dead trees standing for bats. Don't use pesticides. Keep your cats indoors because if they discover a bat roost, they, they, they can wipe it out. Uh, minimize artificial lighting that disturbs bats when they're hunting for insects in the, in the, at night or in the evening. And now let's talk about those wonderful insects, the Lepidopterans, which are the butterflies and moths. They are pollinators. Uh, moths are active at night while butterflies are active during the day. Butterflies are usually more colorful than moths, although there are exceptions. Uh, moths are actually 20 times as numerous as butterflies in nature, but we don't see them as much because we're not active in at night, uh, or at least not, usually not outside, uh, and we don't see them as much. Uh, butterflies have uh, club-tipped antennae, and uh, compared to the moths' uh, antennae, which are more feather-like, and butterflies make chrysalises while moths spin cocoons. So butterfly populations were uh, observed to decline by 33% in a study in Ohio in just two decades due to habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change. Uh, and uh, insect numbers have been observed to be uh, declining at alarming rates all over the world. They, uh, they've, they've called this the insect apocalypse or the bug apocalypse. Uh, for too long, we've been uh, had, had the attitude of killing bugs uh, for our own uh, safety or just uh, because they, they're a nuisance to uh, considered nuisance by some people, but they are absolutely vital in nature. So a decline of uh, three quarters over a quarter of a century, uh, which was measured in, in uh, nature preserves in Germany recently, uh, was uh, just terrifying to, uh, to uh, environmentalists. And, and these kinds of figures have been seen all over the world. So uh, Dave Wagner at uh, UConn uh, points out that a world without insects is a flowerless world uh, because after all plants uh, uh, pollinate, plants need pollinators uh, and so do birds. So we would have silent forests as well. Uh, we would have uh, um, a lot of things that uh, uh, since, since insects are responsible for decomposing, uh, we'd have a lot of uh, uh, plant and animal uh, bodies that wouldn't uh, decompose as readily. And, and, and because insects are so important to the entire uh, food chain, uh, everything would be devastated in nature. So uh, one way that we can help insects uh, is by uh, establishing butterfly gardens. After all, when we provide for butterflies needs, we're welcoming all these other insects at, at simultaneously. Uh, a sun, uh, sun of, uh, well, six hours or so at least, uh, is desirable for a butterfly garden. It's helpful to have a water source nearby, also shelter from the wind, and absolutely essential to have host plants. We can't have butterflies or moths unless we have caterpillars first. Uh, nectar producing plants are, must be provided throughout the growing season in a successful butterfly garden, and organic landscaping practices should also be observed. Uh, please don't bother with a butterfly box. No one has ever seen a butterfly in a butterfly box. We've, uh, pe people have found uh, spiders and wasps uh, and other insects inside these boxes, but never a butterfly. Uh, but we can offer butterflies mud. Uh, the reason that male butterflies 
uh, sip the, the mud is because there are minerals in that mud that they use to create the pheromones, which are chemicals that, that attract the females to them. And then when they mate with the females, they pass those minerals onto the female, which she then uses uh, to, uh, for, for the eggs that she will lay. So we can offer mud to butterflies in a repurposed bird bath or a, a saucer nestled in the ground uh, with uh, gravel or sand in it. And for the minerals, you can add salt or compost and, and keep it moist so that uh, butterflies can sip that, uh, uh, those nutrients. Butterflies also often uh, enjoy eating fruit and they don't seem to care if it's uh, uh, starting to rot. Uh, so uh, it might be fun to put out a, a tray of fruit and see what happens. Uh, and uh, host plants, again, absolutely essential for butterflies. Here are the uh, four most popular uh, host plants. Uh, Goldenrod is, is a host for 125 different species. Strawberry, 81 species. Sunflower is host to 58 and bird's foot trefoil, 32. And the list goes on from there. Many other plants are also important host plants for, uh, uh, for our butterflies and moths. And, uh, but those, we're talking perennials now. But if we look at trees and shrubs, the numbers are much more impressive. Oak leaves, 473 different species. Uh, the members of the genus Prunus, such as beech plum, cherry, and choke cherry, host plants for 411 butterflies and moss. And willows are host to 399 uh, birch trees, 393 different species. Uh, if, if, uh, if you're a female spice bush swallowtail, however, you're going to lay your eggs only on a, either a spice bush or a sassafras tree because no other leaf is edible to the, these cute little. Uh, uh, larvae, the, the caterpillars of the spice bush swallowtail that have these fake eyes on the sides of their head, uh, in which, uh, which uh, serve to startle a would-be predator. Black swallowtail caterpillars must eat the uh, leaves of one of these members of the Apiaceae family, the dill, parsley, carrots, queen anne's lace, fennel, uh, and uh, host plants for Baltimore checker spot are either the beautiful wildflower turtle head, which grows in moist places, or uh, different species of plantain, which are common weeds in people's lawns. So the broadleafed or the narrow leaf plantain. Uh, spring azure butterfly uh, larvae can feed on New Jersey tea, viburnums, meadowsweet, and dogwood leaves, while uh, violet is the host plant for the stunningly beautiful great spangled fritillary. Uh, and there is no butterfly more well-known or popular than the monarch. Uh, we are inspired by its uh, heroic uh, migrations. Uh, and, and as many people are aware, monarchs need common milkweed as a host plant. There is no other plant uh, or no other genus of plants than this genus Asclepius that uh, caterpillars can eat. But I do not suggest that you plant common milkweed in your garden because it's uh, uh, way too aggressive. It sends out uh, subterranean runners. It'll pop up anywhere. And before you know it, the entire garden will, and your, your entire property, uh, unless uh, you're mowing, uh, will be infested with common milkweed. So instead, I suggest you consider swamp milkweed and butterfly weed, both, both of which are also host plants for monarchs. As the name implies, swamp milkweed can grow in wet places, but it also does fine in normal soil. Butterfly weed, uh, uh, in contrast, uh, can uh, handle dry soil, but also uh, normal soil is again is fine. So the two plants uh, could grow side by side. Uh, poke milkweed is advisable for a shady garden. Monarchwatch.org has monitored the populations of, of uh, monarchs overwintering in Mexico, and there have been steadily declining numbers uh, due primarily to the use of glyphosate uh, in herbicide resistant uh, GMO crops, which uh, kills the, uh, the, mon the uh, milkweed, which the monarchs depend on. Uh, in addition, pesticide use, climate change, and logging and development have, have uh, reduced their numbers as well. Uh, so you can proudly proclaim that you're helping monarchs by ordering one of these monarch way stations signs uh, from Monarch Watch. And uh, an example of a monarch way station is offered here by edibleterrace.com. There are 12 different species of plants. Two of them are grasses. Notice how the flowers are bunched in uh, 
together in, in species in clumps of the same species so that uh, butterflies and other uh, pollinators can easily find the next plant that they're looking for. Uh, and uh, it's great for the, for the plants themselves to be uh, pollinated in that way. And also for the pollinators where, where they don't have to travel as far to find the next plant that they're looking for. Uh, Sharon Stichter offered this uh, list of her top 15 butterfly plants and, and uh, it was printed by the uh, North American Butterfly Association, naba.org, which is a great uh, resource for information about butterflies. Incidentally, there are butterfly clubs out there and there is a Massachusetts butterfly club that, that has been active over the years. So uh, she included butterfly bush in this list uh, that, that she made a decade ago. Uh, she might have changed her mind since then because uh, butterfly bush is uh, indisputably quite attractive to female, to, to both female and male butterflies when they're um, nectaring. However, it's not a host plant for any uh, butterfly or moth. And more importantly, uh, butterfly bush is, uh, is apparently invasive and will probably become more so uh, here in New England as the weather continues to warm. Um, so it's uh, a, a more uh, advisable to use New Jersey tea, for example, a small shrub that's a native shrub, quite attractive to butterflies, so is sweet pepper bush. Uh, compass plant, a very tall perennial. Uh, it's also called cup plant. You can see how the, the leaves actually surround the stem in such a way that when it rains, there's a, a reservoir of water there that uh, where insects uh, and birds can uh, drink that water. Blazing star, beautiful uh, perennial that draws in the butterflies. And thistle is also a, attractive to them. It, it's a somewhat weedy plant, but uh, there's no disputing that it's a butterfly friendly plant. So are all the asters uh, that bloom in the fall and uh, the stunningly beautiful purple coneflower. Uh, scabiosa is another one, and so uh, is Joe Pieweed, a tall perennial that uh, is, is happy in moist places but also grows in normal soil. The same can be true of boneset. Same can be said of boneset, another popular plant, and, and the milkweeds. Uh, when, they, uh, when they're in flower, all, all kinds of butterflies and other insects will be seen helping themselves to that uh, ample supply of nectar that uh, milkweed flowers offer. Uh, and then there are the annuals, the zinnia, Mexican sunflower, and the marigolds, none of which are native, but they're all butterfly magnets. Uh, and consider uh, the possibility that some of the plants that you establish, uh, purple coneflower might be one of them, incidentally, because I, I know that woodchucks and other animals do uh, enjoy eating it. Uh, and New England aster, I found, is another one that uh, deer seem to like. Uh, now, if you want to learn about uh, deer resistant native plants, the New England Wildflower Society, Cornell Cooperative Extension, will give you lists of those plants that you can uh, be assured a deer won't uh, trouble with. And, uh, and as for groundhogs, again, Cornell Cooperative Extension is a useful resource and uh, rabbit resistant plants can be found uh, at their uh, Pennsylvania State University uh, Extension Service. Uh, now you may not have adequate land for a, a butterfly garden or any other pollinator garden, but in, in which case you might consider container gardening. And the larger container, the better, because you can have more plants in it and also that, that soil will not dry out as readily. Uh, it, and uh, container gardening does require frequent uh, irrigation uh, unless you uh, figure out a, a clever system of wicking water into those pots uh, without uh, uh, and you can visit uh, uh, resources online that will demonstrate how to do that. Uh, the, the strip of land between a sidewalk and a road can become, uh, instead of uh, a, a, hell, a hell strip, as it's been called, uh, uh, it, can be, it can become habitat for pollinators, including butterflies, and uh, a delight to the eye of human passersby. <clears throat> uh, and Susanna Lerman uh, has done a study in Springfield, Massachusetts, demonstrating that if we simply mow less often, like every other week instead of every week, uh, and don't use herbicides, uh, these delightful flowers, including clover, violets, uh, wild strawberry, uh, bluets, uh, these, these little um, uh, mints that, mint plants that grow like self-heal and uh, bugle, other flowers, sometimes you'll see people uh, avoid mowing their flowers uh, 
and, and leaving little islands of flowers in their lawn because they can't uh, bear to, to cut them down. And so uh, just consider that if you mow every other week and if you mow at a height of no closer than three or four inches, uh, you'll be helping the pollinators. Uh, Susanna Lerman's study uh, showed that no less than 111 different species of native bees showed up in her, uh, in, in those lawns that were mowed every other week. Uh, and also consider that clover seed used to be actually part of the grass seed mix that was sold commercially because it was assumed that everyone would want uh, clover in their lawns. Uh, clover, uh, uh, because it's a nitrogen fixing plant actually makes the soil more, more fertile and so that the, uh, your, your lawn will be healthier if, uh, if it has clover in it. Uh, but the, the best uh, uh, thing of, of, of uh, the best way to attract a large number of uh, butterflies and, and other pollinators is to have a meadow. And you, and you can establish a meadow if you have 400 square feet or more of land that it's a uh, uh, it does need at least that much, but 400 square feet is, is not all that an impressive uh, area. And uh, the, the, the entire first year uh, of an, an, an entire year needs to be devoted to eliminating whatever vegetation is there, whether it's a lawn, uh, whether it's uh, weeds or, or other vegetation, um, either by smothering it or by uh, repeated tilling or by responsibly using uh, herbicides that won't harm the environment. Extension.unh.edu is a good resource to learn about the establishment of wildflower meadows. Please resist the temptation to buy uh, wildflower seed, uh, which is offered at big box stores and other place, you know, a seed in a, in a, uh, a, a, a meadow in a box or something like that, a meadow in a can. And, uh, and then just throwing it over your soil because uh, the weed seeds will overtake that, those wildflower uh, and, and grass plants that need to be part of the meadow. Um, so, uh, but consider if it's done well, uh, eventually all you have to do is mow once a year in the spring uh, to make sure that the plant or the, uh, the, uh, that area does not revert to uh, woodlands uh, and that you, you'd be saving a lot of money uh, that you otherwise would be spending uh, mowing so frequently. And uh, when it comes to uh, pollinators, there's nothing that, uh, that can match bees in terms of their efficiency, simply because they have fuzzy bodies that the pollen readily sticks to. And the honeybee is the one bee that most of us are familiar with and, and think about when we think about uh, bees and pollinating. Uh, but it, it just so happens that the honeybee is a non-native bee. It was brought here by the British uh, uh, when they first colonized uh, uh, the Americas. And um, before the, this honeybee arrived, we had uh, some 400 different species of native bees. A uh, uh, number of their species are now declining. And, and in, in fact, uh, honeybees can at times be, uh, be competitive with native bees. But it's certainly true that uh, they're important to humans as uh, uh, for their role in pollinator, pollinating our crops and uh, making honey as well. Uh, bees and wasps are not the same. Uh, wasps are, don't have as fuzzy bodies as bees do and their legs dangle when they fly. And, it, and a yellow jacket is an example of a wasp, not a bee. And we're much more likely to be stung by a, by a yellow jacket uh, or perhaps wasps if we come near their nests than by bees. Um, bumblebees are native bees and they're the, they're the other kind of bee that uh, many of us recognize. Uh, uh, and uh, there are several different species of bumblebees. They all have uh, pollen baskets they, uh, on their hind legs, which uh, they gather, uh, actively gather the pollen because it's a source of protein uh, and uh, bring it to the hive. Uh, the female starts her, her hive in the spring from scratch every year. Uh, and uh, so she has to find a lot of nourishment, a lot of pollen and nectar to, to, uh, to, uh, to lay those eggs and care for them and to uh, nourish herself in the process uh, in the spring. That's a, it's the really important for that reason to offer a lot of pollinator plants that are spring blooming. Uh, eventually, a colony might grow to have several hundred individuals of bumblebees, uh, which is still much less than the thousands that you'll find in a honeybee hive. Uh, bumblebees are 
experts at pollinating tomato uh, flowers and other members of the Solanaceae family, such as eggplant, peppers, and potatoes. Uh, the, this is an unusual flower because the pollen is inside the anther, so the bumblebee knows just what to do. It dangles from the flower and vibrates it with, uh, at a special frequency uh, with using its thoracic muscles, uh, which dislodges the pollen from inside the anthers. The, the pollen then tumbles onto the body of the bumblebee, which it can then collect and bring back to the hive. So for this reason, um, the, the uh, farmers who, who raise tomatoes uh, often offer uh, bumblebee boxes for their colonies. Other bumblebee pollinated crops include raspberries, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and cucumbers. An, an example of a native flower that uh, is attractive to bumblebees and, and uh, that only bumblebees can, can manage to uh, uh, pollinate is the turtle head. And there's an ample reward of nectar down at the base of that flower. Uh, but as you can see, that bumblebee has to really work to get down inside there and then has to manage to turn around uh, and then exit. Uh, so it can be quite comical to watch a flower with a, a bumblebee inside it. Uh, but uh, you can imagine that uh, plants really are, uh, uh, they, uh, it's in their interest to have brand loyalty. Now, uh, when uh, a pollinator visits a flower, uh, that it's, it's in the plant's interest to have that, uh, to, to uh, motivate that uh, insect to then look for exactly the same kind of flower uh, on a different plant to deliver that pollen uh, to that flower. And so the bumblebee um, is rewarded amply uh, for its efforts and, and then motivated to go find another turtle head to pollinate. Uh, the same is true of bottle gentian. No other insect is strong enough, uh, no other insect than the bumblebee to open this flower, which never, uh, the petals never open, uh, so the bumblebee is able to force its way inside to get the nectar of the bottle gentian. Uh, rusty patched bumblebees were once common here in New England. Now they are uh, gone uh, from our area and endangered elsewhere. American bumblebees are also significantly, uh, have significantly declined and are threatened. Um, the, the two most common bumblebees uh, in our area are the uh, two-spotted bumblebee and the common eastern bumblebee. Uh, you can see the, the gray bars here, which represent uh, uh, more recent population numbers compared to the older black bars. Uh, and notice then that, that many species have either completely disappeared or are significantly less numerous than they used to be. Uh, this is due to climate change, loss of habitat, but also pests, pathogens, pesticides, poor nutrition, pollution because pollinators uh, smell their flowers, but they can't smell as well if there's pollution in the air. And plants that are non-natives and invasives uh, also uh, are, uh, are, are uh, eliminating the veg vegetation that, uh, or, uh, or reducing the amount of vegetation that are, is uh, pollinator friendly. Uh, and it's, it's not just the active ingredients that we need to be concerned about with these pesticides. Uh, a, study, a recent study in Britain demonstrated that the so-called inert uh, ingredients are actually sometimes more toxic than the active ingredients. Uh, and because these uh, inert ingredients are trade secrets, uh, we often, uh, well, we simply don't know uh, what's in these products, uh, but uh, it's demonstrated that they can be lethal to bumblebees and other insects. Um, we can leave uh, abandoned mouse and bird nests because they are a good habitat for bumblebees uh, to create their colonies. Uh, and in general, leave it be landscaping is good for all wildlife. But I don't want, I don't mean to suggest that uh, if you simply stop mowing, you're going to have a beautiful and nature friendly landscape. Uh, on the contrary, the most likely thing that will happen is that you'll have a tangle uh, of plants that is, that includes a lot of invasive plants uh, and that may offer uh, very little habitat uh, for wildlife that's th functionally. So uh, it, uh, I assure you that those beautiful purple coneflowers were established deliberately. They didn't just uh, pop up. Uh, so leave it be landscaping is important for bumblebees and other insects and wildlife. Uh, bumblebee nesting boxes, you can uh, either build one or, or order one. Uh, and you have some, perhaps one chance out of five that a bumblebee will set up shop in one of these. Um, there are actually a couple of flies that look like bumblebees 
uh, to protect themselves. Um, now, uh, a sweat bee is another kind of native bee that is a ground dwelling bee. It's called a sweat bee because it, uh, it's attracted to human perspiration, but it's entirely um, safe. Uh, you don't need to be concerned about being stung by a sweat bee. Uh, and it's ground dwelling. The, uh, in fact, 70% of our native bees are ground dwelling and they are generalists. They can visit a number of different kinds of flowers uh, and digest a lot of different kinds of pollen. Um, a remarkable ground nesting bee, this plasterer bee, uh, the female can line a cavity with something that resembles and serves as plastic. Uh, in other words, it, it will protect um, that cavity from being uh, uh, inundated with water uh, or uh, also protect it from uh, any predator that might want to consume that egg or the, the developing uh, larva inside. Uh, and she provisions that uh, cavity with uh, liquid food, the, the pollen and nectar combination, and then uh, lays the egg on the side so it'll just drop down and feed and then uh, uh, matures into an adult insect and, and chews its way through that plastic bag. Uh, to uh, to have it uh, to emerge, um, so we can offer habitat for ground nesting bees by establishing areas of uh, of our property that are devoid of vegetation, several yards across, uh, with loose, well drained or sandy soil, flat areas or earthen banks work well. Uh, sunny and south facing slopes are also ideal. Uh, soil filled planters can even be uh, a means of offering uh, habitat for ground nesting bees and. It's advisable to stay off these areas so that you don't uh, disturb th them when they're uh, uh, creating those holes. And uh, you can also offer grasses for ground nesting bees because the ground underneath the grasses can be used uh, for the, those bees to make their tunnels. Uh, the mason bee does not uh, tunnel in the ground, but rather uses uh, cavities that it finds in nature, such as the uh, uh, hollow stalks uh, to lay its eggs. And mason bees are incredibly uh, efficient pollinators of fruit trees because they're much more likely to uh, visit uh, once once they've uh, uh, pollinated a particular flower uh, they're more likely to uh, leave that tree and go to a different tree uh, and deposit that pollen uh, uh, and, and, uh, and accomplish pollination whereas a honeybee is much more likely to stay on the same tree and visit flower after flower after flower which does that tree no good until that honeybee finally decides to go elsewhere and deliver the pollen to a different tree. So mason bees are hundreds of times more efficient than hun honeybees uh, for uh, at pollinating uh, orchard trees. And, and they need mud because as the name implies mason bee, they use that mud to partition their egg chambers in those hollow stalks. Uh, and remarkably, this leaf cutter bee uh, is able to cut perfect circles out of the leaf blade and then roll them up and insert them into the cavity. That's where she will lay her eggs and provision them with the uh, bee bread, the, the uh, pollen and uh, nectar. Leafcutter bees can pollinate blueberries, onions, carrots, and alfalfa. Uh, and here are some of the leaves that they can use to make those, uh, uh, part uh, those uh, uh, cavities uh, that, they, that they line with the leaf blades. Uh, and uh, I was so proud when I saw last year in my, I have a plant called tick trefoil, which is a per, an herbaceous perennial tree, uh, excuse me, a, a, an herb. Uh, and I saw uh, circles cut out of those leaves, perfect circles. And I knew immediately that I had leaf cutter bees and I was uh, so pleased to see that. Uh, so uh, don't panic if you see uh, circles cut out of your rose uh, bush, for example, on the lower right, uh, the image in the lower right of this slide are, are rose leaves. Uh, you can be assured that there, there's still plenty of surface area for those leaves to photosynthesize and the bush won't be harmed a bit with a few holes uh, caused by leaf cutter bee uh, action. Uh, so someone drilled a hole, drilled, dr drilled three holes in this block of wood and uh, leaf cutter bees use the top hole and you can see about a half dozen uh, separate chambers there surrounded by leaf blades. Uh, rosin bees use the middle one and they used rosin to partition the chambers, whereas uh, you'll see the uh, walls of mud between the cocoons uh, in the lower uh, hole that mason bees used. Uh, we can offer uh, a bee hotel to these cavity nesting bees uh, by any with any of the uh, pictured stems that are hollow 
um, hunt, a Japanese knotweed, uh, the, that terrible invasive alien, uh, the stalks of the of last year's uh, shoots that are uh, those those dead stalks uh, that are hollow and uh, and uh, uh, solid at uh, at regular intervals uh, can be uh, are ideal in some in many ways. You want them to be three thirty second inches to three eighths inch wide. And the uh, the wider they are, the deeper they need to be. Uh, and notice how uh, the, the image in the middle on the on the bottom of this slide, uh, someone is wrapping a, a piece of paper around a dowel or a, or a pencil can also be used, and that will be inserted into one of these hollow stalks, uh, so that uh, at the end of the season, uh, that uh, it can be removed, and the and the uh, the cocoons then uh, would. Uh, 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 you can do quality control. The, the diseased mason bee cocoons would be uh, disposed of and the healthy ones can be saved uh, in the refrigerator for the entire winter. Uh, they would be put out in a, in a release box in the spring after all danger of hard frost is gone. Uh, and that's one way that many people have enjoyed uh, helping uh, our native bees that are cavity nesters. The best plants for native bees uh, in your garden and landscape, uh, the best herbaceous perennials uh, uh, were, measured, were discovered to be uh, the following. Uh, wild bergamot in first place because it attracts 15 different native bee genera. Uh, you'll perhaps recognize the wild bergamot as being uh, quite similar to bee balm. It's also, uh, it's a different member of the Monarda genus. Monarda didyma is the bee balm, which has those stunningly red uh, flowers, but wild bergamot, the beautiful pink flowers, uh, is the most attractive uh, to uh, wild bees and also to uh, butterflies. Uh, Black-eyed Susan in second place at 14 different native bee genera. Um, Boneset, uh, 13 at third place. And then tied for fourth, we've got the different milkweeds, swamp milkweed and butterfly weed, also tick seed, oxeye sunflower, Mountain mint and blue vervain, which is uh, does well in uh, damp areas, um, and mountain mint is an, a remarkable plant. Uh, just it's a real lesson in entomology to to see uh, so many different insects visit these flowers for the number of weeks that they are in they are blooming. The, the flowers are not particularly showy, but there must be something very appealing about the nectar that they offer because uh, so many different insects, including this great black wasp, which is a beautiful insect and totally harmless, by the way. Tachinid fly, which is a beneficial insect, the bumblebees and so many others uh, will visit these flowers. Uh, and uh, mountain mint also uh, is useful as a tea. It's a spearmint-like tea and uh, uh, remarkably, if you take some of these leaves and, and uh, rub them uh, and apply them to your skin, uh, it's an effective mosquito repellent that's effective for about a half hour before you would need to reapply it. Uh, mountain mint, being a mint, it, it knows how to, uh, uh, the, the colony will grow, but it's not as uh, difficult to control as some, as some mints are. Uh, and then we have foxglove beard tongue, cup plant, New England aster, golden alexanders. Uh, of these plants, foxglove beard tongue and golden alexanders are both spring blooming, while New England aster is a fall blooming plant. And then attracting 10 different native bee genera, we have the fall blooming aster, big leaf aster, we have the uh, wild geranium, which is blooming now in the spring, and yellow coneflower. Uh, and then um, Anise hyssop, a wonderful pollinator plant, purple coneflower, again, uh, Jacob's ladder, Ohio spiderwort, uh, iron, ironweed, which is quite tall perennial, Culver's root, which can grow in the shade, uh, and attracting uh, eight uh, or seven uh, different native bee genera, we have harebell, wild lupin, and bloodroot. Now, a word about uh, cultivars, the purple coneflower uh, straight species, you can see what it looks like and it's the, the native plant looks like an upper left image. But uh, these others are all one, uh, three of the hundred different cultivars that have been created by breeding. Uh, the green jewel, however, really can't even be seen by uh, pollinators because they see colors differently than we do. Uh, Double delight has absolutely nothing to offer them. There's no pollen or nectar there, only petals. And even the magnus uh, which is bred for more uh, showy flowers, 
uh, it just does not have the pollinator value that the original purple coneflower, or uh, you can also refer to it as the straight species does. So, um, and, and one consideration also is that uh, there's new, not only can there be less nutrition for pollinators, but also there's, there's less genetic variation in these cultivars and which, which might make them more vulnerable to pests and diseases. They also may not be, be open pollinated or, or self seed compared to the wild types. They are less adapted to local soils and climate and can be difficult to establish and maintain for that reason. And they may distract pollinators from, from visiting wild plants. Uh, finally, they might hybridize with native species, which is, affects the survival, uh, survivability of those native species. Now, uh, non-bee plants uh, are, are, uh, are either have very low or no value for pollinators. Pansy, daylily, hybrid tea rose, there's no pollen or nectar there. Likewise, double marigold, the petunia and New Guinea impatiens, begonia, peony, forsythia, all have very low pollinator value. And now, uh, to round out our list of the beneficials, the invertebrate predators and parasites. Uh, spiders prey on everything possible, praying mantises likewise, so they're both considered to be generalists, but really the mo much more valuable predators are those that focus on, uh, on the pest insects. Lacewings are a perfect example of this. It's the larvae that prey on the mealybug spider mites, thrips, aphids, and caterpillars. And then uh, uh, the adult lacewings are pollinators. Uh, you can offer lacewings a hotel by rolling up a piece of cardboard, inserting it into a uh, plastic bottle with the, with the bottom cut off and then hanging that from a tree or shrub. Ladybug beetles, uh, again, it's the larvae that uh, are the predators of aphids, mites, and mealybugs. And the ladybug beetle uh, adults, again, are pollinators. Ladybug hotels can be offered simply by putting pine cones in a mesh bag and hanging that from a tree. Fireflies are beneficials because they prey on insect larvae, snails, and slugs. We can offer them low-hanging trees, forest litter, long grasses, ponds, and streams. Uh, please don't use synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. Also, please turn off your outdoor lights because that uh, distracts the, the fireflies from mating. Uh, assassin bugs are very effective predators, as are the hoverflies or surfid flies. They prey on aphids, the larvae prey on aphids, and again, the adults are pollinators. Uh, and the trichogramma wasp is a parasite. It, it's able to lay its eggs in the eggs of species of insects that are much larger than it is. Uh, and uh, those eggs will uh, be nourished by those eggs and uh, the host eggs. And of course the host itself will die as a result. And uh, the bracketed wasps, there are so many of them. There's an astounding diversity of species of bracketed wasps that uh, specialize on different hosts and therefore are quite uh, valuable as parasites that uh, control the populations of pest insects. Uh, so to attract these uh, parasites and predators, uh, offer flowers for the adult insects, the Queen Anne's lace dill and fennel in the family Apiaceae, uh, and the aster family, Asteraceae, goldenrod, tansy, marigold, dandelion, boneset, yarrow, coreopsis, aster, all of them attractive to wasps and other beneficials. Um, Flowers for predators and parasites also can be found in the mint family. Horse mint is a great one to attract wasps. Uh, bugleweed is a, a flower for pollinators that is often found in people's lawns. Then there's that first placed wild bergamot that's so great for uh, wild uh, native bees. It's also good for the other beneficials. Uh, Anis hyssop again. Um, uh, and if you think about, uh, uh, if you're a farmer, you're aware of IPM, integrated pest management. Uh, why not call it intelligent pest, pest management? Because why would anyone uh, want to kill uh, uh, using uh, pesticides to kill the very insects that are do doing us uh, so, so much benefit in the environment and helping us to protect us from the pests? So um, in order to control uh, garden pests naturally uh, or in a more healthy way, uh, consider using barriers such as floating row covers. They're quite effective in in uh, preventing uh, pests from uh, gaining access to our plants. Companion plants can sometimes be useful in repelling those pests. Hand picking can sometimes be feasible. And if we use 
pesticides, they should be organic and demonstrated to be safe to the, uh, to the non-pest in insects. Uh, but also consider that trees and shrubs, uh, not just herbaceous plants, are uh, pollinator, uh, pollinator plants that in some cases are, are even more valuable. For example, the willow, uh, nothing beats the, the value of a willow tree, the, the, the sheer number of flowers, the amount of pollen and, uh, and nectar that's offered to these insects uh, in the spring when they really need it. Uh, it's, it's quite impressive. So uh, th that puts willow trees right at the top of your list of pollinator plants. Uh, witch hazels are uh, providing um, uh, uh, forage for, uh, both in the spring and fall, depending on the species here. Uh, Redbud, a stunningly beautiful tree uh, that's a, uh, offering uh, pollinators uh, food source and then and so are fruit trees. Uh, the American plum is a native fruit tree. Uh, the beech plum is a native shrub uh, that flowers. The black cherry and choke cherry also have flowers for pollinators. So do Virginia rose and Carolina rose and Rugosa rose. And then there's that beautiful tree, the Juneberry, and uh, even trees such as maples and oaks, which don't have uh, conspicuous flowers, do have pollen and nectar that helps bees uh, find uh, food and basswood is a great tree uh, to attract honeybees. High bush blueberry is a pollinator plant. So is the red osier dogwood. So is the common nine bark. Fantastic for uh, uh, attracting a wide variety of insects. But please don't uh, use the uh, colored, uh, the darkly colored leaf cultivars uh, because uh, it's not uh, those those plants uh, do, do not offer. Uh, edible leaves for such beetles as the nine bark leaf beetle. Um, winterberry holly is, is also a pollinator plant, uh, as is staghorn sumac uh, and the viburnums uh, and the native hydrangeas, panicle hydrangea and smooth hydrangea, also are visited by pollinators. And the mountain laurel, which can be grown in the shade, is a magnet for pollinators, including butterflies, a beautiful uh, shrub uh, that's a native plant. Spring ephemerals are another category of pollinator plant. Uh, they they uh, emerge before the leaves have leafed out, and so they can uh, uh, they can uh, do their photosynthesis um, with the available sunlight in that way. Uh, crocuses are exa another example. The grape hyacinth, Siberian squill, uh, wild bleeding heart actually can bloom again in the fall, and the bloodroot is another example of a native spring ephemeral. Uh, and annuals for pollinators include the sunflower, Mexican sunflower, zinnia, spider flower, uh, ageratum sweetalyssum, borage, pineapple sage, cosmos, and so many others. Uh, and if you're growing culinary herbs uh, and allow them to flower, then uh, basil and chives can be beneficial for them. And so can rosemary, oregano, lavender, and catmint, very popular with pollinators. Uh, Kathy Neal has offered this flowering calendar for native pollinator plants. Uh, rule of thumb is that you want to have at least three plants in bloom at all times. So if you have three spring blooming plants, three summer blooming, and three late summer and fall blooming plants, uh, then you will have at least covered the basics. But eventually you are, you're going to want substantially more species than that simply because it's so uh, uh, it's so delightful to have that diversity, and the diversity is important uh, to attract different kinds of pollinators. Uh, notice how this chart shows you the color of the, the bloom of that plant, and it also shows you how long the plant is in bloom. So, uh, and I, again, this is a resource that I can send to you uh, if you uh, uh, send an email message to me, uh, uh, and I'll provide my email message at the end of the program. Uh, and the resource here is available extension.unht.edu, the same one uh, that uh, gives information about wildflower meadows. You can find Kathy Neal's pollinator plants from Northern New England. Uh, now, many of these plants, um, uh, it, it, since you want a lot of plants and a lot of different kinds of plants, the, the cheapest way to get them is to grow them from seed. But many seeds require uh, an experience of winter before they will germinate, a prolonged period of cool temperatures in moist conditions. 
uh, uh, notice it has to, uh, that it has to be cool uh, as in between 34 and 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So freezing temperatures do not contribute to that uh, process of releasing the seeds from dormancy. Uh, it's not until the, uh, the, the temperatures are cool uh, uh, is, is that uh, uh, cold treatment effective. Uh, now, if you, uh, so that's, that's the reason that, uh, that the refrigerators are ideal for this because they're just the right temperature uh, providing that, uh, that, uh, that narrow window of uh, just above freezing. And in order to keep them moist in those pl plastic bags, you use either vermiculite or sand for large seeds, uh, moist paper towel for small seeds. And then in a matter of a, a month or two, those seeds are ready to be planted in, uh, uh, in pots uh, or in trays. Uh, I invite you to visit wildseedproject.org or, or either of the other uh, websites listed here. And uh, Wild Seed Project also is a source for purchasing those seeds. Uh, in, incidentally, you can also uh, give seeds uh, the experience of, tr experience of winter simply by leaving them outside in the winter. But if you do that, and in, uh, uh, you know, in moist soil, uh, if you do that, you might need to protect the soil from animals that, uh, that might find the seeds and eat them. Uh, and you can grow wildflowers from seed in, in, a, in a tray like this. They don't seem to mind being uh, quite crowded. Uh, at first, but eventually you will want to give them their own, uh, uh, put them in cells as, as is shown in this uh, photo. Uh, and it's, they're called plugs when they develop in these, uh, set in these cells separately. Uh, and uh, you can buy plugs, but uh, in general, you need to buy a lot of them. You need to buy a whole tray uh, of a particular species. So again, it's more economical if you can uh, plant them, grow them from seed yourself. Uh, and uh, you're assured that every, uh, every one of these plants is genetically unique. It, they are not clones of each other. Uh, however, clones can be useful in uh, just uh, in increasing the sheer number of plants on your property. Uh, this plant was, uh, which is a swamp milkweed, uh, those four stems were in one cluster and I was able to separate them uh, quite easily. Uh, each one had its own supply of roots and then plant them in different locations. Uh, so uh, Rutgers Master Gardeners gives tips about dividing perennials. Uh, another way is by layering. If you uh, bury that stem in soil, it will induce it to root and then sever it from the parent plant and plant it elsewhere. Uh, and cuttings are another way to get more plants from one parent plant. Uh, you remove the lower, after you cut the stem, uh, part of the stem of that plant, you would remove the lower leaves uh, instead of plunging the leaves into the soil. Uh, and uh, here is a list of native plant nurseries in Massachusetts and New England native plant seed companies. I highly recommend New England wetland plants. Uh, the, the name is misleading because they, they actually offer seeds and plants uh, that will flourish in a variety of conditions. Uh, Prairie Moon Nursery also has a, a good uh, reputation as to, as to Vermont Wildflower Seed, Wild Seed Project, all of them are good. Uh, uh, they and and consider these places as resources, not just of seeds and plants, but also of um, uh, guidance uh, or uh, information. If you have uh, uh, special conditions, uh, whether it's extremes of pH or moisture or dryness, or uh, uh, or uh, perhaps at, uh, you know shady or, or sunny locations they'll be able to tell you what plants would be able to succeed well in those conditions. Uh, expertise uh, can also be uh, found uh, in the Tower Hill Hort line. Master, Gardeners, Master gardeners will be able to uh, give you an idea of a plant that you're puzzled about if you send them a photo, or if you have an unhealthy plant and want to know how to bring it back to health, uh, they might be able to help you with that as well. Consider joining a garden club to learn a lot about plants and to and perhaps uh, you can swap plants and, and grow your collection in that way. Uh, and or simply making friends with uh, gardeners in your neighborhood uh, and it can be a, a source of, uh, of both plants and friendship and camaraderie and uh, and for that matter in the spirit of uh, barn raisings if you uh, if, if we help each other uh, establish uh, uh, gardens either on uh, 
uh, private or public land, uh, we're helping pollinators and we're uh, broadening our circle of our social circles as well. It can be quite uh, a wonder wonderful uh, lifelong relationships. So invite children to be stewards of nature. It, it, they can have the experience of success and their self-esteem can be boosted uh, when they are able to grow plants successfully. If they're growing uh, uh, plants for uh, 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 for produce, then uh, they can taste what real food tastes like, and uh, they'll be uh, drawn to eating healthy food uh, as as, uh, as as adults. And they'll also, uh, if we foster love and respect for nature in children, they will grow to become advocates uh, and protectors of nature. Um, all decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. Uh, there is no limit to what we can do together. Start where you are and thank you for doing your part. Here's my uh, email address, info at johnroot.net and feel free again to send me a message. I will send you a list of the resources that I use to create this presentation and I'd be interested to hear any comments or questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, if anyone has any questions at this point, they can unmute themselves and ask. I didn't see anything in the chat. Yeah, that was amazing. That was very I'd, thorough. <laughs> I'd be interested to hear if anyone already has pollinator gardens and uh, what, are, what some of your favorite plants might be. I have a question. It's, um, I have I've been trying to replace um, some plants with native plants and I planted a choke cherry last year okay. and looking good. And then I looked at it and it looked all chewed up. So I think maybe it's a little too successful with being eaten by something. Now, let me ask you, is that a choke cherry or a choke berry? Choke cherry. Choke cherry, okay. Uh, because it's, it's unusual for someone to plant a choke cherry. Usually that's one of those plants that just shows up. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm I've been buying native species that I see, you know, okay. growing everywhere. <laughs> now, uh, ch uh, cherry trees are susceptible to, uh, uh, well, uh, I guess they're they're visited by those moths that. Uh, or, oh or, yeah, the winter moths. But uh, winter. I'm, but, you know, this this is one of those situations where uh, you know that uh, uh, Hort line uh, resource that I uh, okay. uh, that one of those last slides that I showed. Uh, the Tower Hill Botanical Garden has a hort line that's staffed by master gardeners. And if you sh share a photo with them, or perhaps an extension service, uh, local extension service might be able to help you out with that. Okay. And then, so another comment I have is that um, for years I had Asclepius tuberosa, which is the, the orange uh, milkweed, and I never had any right. butterflies on it. But then uh, I... Butterfly weed, butterfly weed, yeah. Yep, and now I have, um, I believe it's probably the common and you're right, it's getting pretty amazingly massive, but boy, I had so many monarch eggs last year. Yeah, monarchs do love it. There's no question about it. That's all, I don't really have a. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Anybody? I have a question. Yeah, I do. Sure. Hi, my name is Susan. And my question is, I hung out a hummingbird feeder this year for the first time, and it keeps getting emptied. All of the sugar water keeps disappearing. And it's just, um, it's not like it's dripping slowly. It's just something is drinking it. I have raccoons, I have squirrels. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any idea who is emptying this feeder and what I can do about it. So I, I boil up the sugar so water and I let it cool and then I yeah, pour yeah. it in there. Yeah. That's a mystery to me. Uh, anyone here uh, have an answer for Susan? I saw a video recently of bats drinking. Someone had a night vision camera and they had bats swarming a uh, hummingbird feeder. Oh, interesting. So maybe I should bring it in at night. Well, no, they're hungry too. Hungry too. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but something's emptying it entirely. In other words, not, they're not just sipping it, just it goes from being full to being completely empty. It'll hang there for, you know, like for a day or two and then all of a sudden it'll just be completely gone. All the, all the nectar is gone, if you wanna call it nectar. 
the sugar water. Hmm. Okay, I'll just get it. I'll hire a detective. <laughs> well, oh, thank I you. I guess that's another that's another motivation to plant uh, hummingbird friendly plants. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's a, okay. Yeah. I have I have those. Two. I have that whatever that honeysuckle is that has the long finger like flowers. You you named it you and you showed a picture of it. The trumpet flower. Uh, trumpet flowers, yes, I have those, and I I do see bees there and hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. John, I wonder how um, how good is it really to have sugar water? It seems so like such a negative food. Well, it's an attractant, so we enjoy them, but is it really good for the hummingbirds? Well, I've I've wondered that myself, and. Uh, it doesn't seem to be so. Uh, it, it it does not seem to be uh, bad enough for them to affect their populations. I mentioned that uh, ruby throats are are have actually doubled their populations. I don't know if it's in spite of or because of the feeding uh, that people do, but um, uh, but I but it is uh, a risk that you run uh, that you might actually do them harm if you're not really vigilant about cleaning those feeders. Yeah. Hank, could you post the um, your contact information? Yeah. I'm totally overwhelmed by the information, and yeah. I want to be able to go back. Yes. Yeah, so my email address is info at johnroot.net. Johnroot.net. Okay. Yeah, I'm typing it out in the chat also. And okay. this, this presentation will also be broadcast by Falmouth uh, Community Television. Yeah. They might even provide it as uh, as a YouTube on their website. Yeah. Good because I need to see it again. It's yeah, and we're yeah, we are recording it too, and I can I will post it on our social media. But. Great, thank you. I, I have to leave, and I just want to say thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed watching this and learning. Well, thank you. Yeah, this thanks so wonderful. much, John. Thank Me you. Too. Thank yes. you. And thank that, you. yes, thanks everyone for coming, and thank you so much, John, for doing this. Okay, and I and I will. In fact, I will email the group as soon as I have the video ready. Anyway, so if people want it, they'll know where to find it because there is a lot of information. You may want to watch it again and slow it down or take notes. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Have a great night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. Good night.